Science fiction irrefutably dominates pop culture these days. It is the beating heart of modern fandom, and aspects of this genre find their way into almost every big budget film, franchise, and game. And yet, sci-fi is relatively new in the grand scheme of things. The term science fiction was coined less than a hundred years ago, and although the ideas that make up the genre are as old as the art of storytelling itself, they have never had such a presence as they do in today's media. Sci-fi has become the mainstream, to the point where it can be hard to remember a time before superheroes and starships were part of everyday conversational fodder. Today, I want to take you back through the ages on our own little time-traveling trip to investigate the origins of the science fiction genre. We're gonna have to go all the way back to the birth of human storytelling in order to figure out how these tales of time travel, outer space, and aliens are somehow some of the most timely, grounded, and human stories that we tell. Let's begin by defining what science fiction is, a task that is far from easy. If you break it down into its component parts, it wouldn't be hard to claim that it was fiction about science. Which is sort of true, but not the entire picture. I mean, Star Wars is about as scientifically grounded as The Lord of the Rings. Isaac Asimov, one of the greatest sci-fi writers of the 20th century, defined it as that branch of literature which deals with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and technology. I think this definition sufficiently covers the basics. Sci-fi is less about science and more about humanity's reaction to science, and in particular, the changes that this science produces. It allows us to speculate on the past, present, and future, to put our ideas to the test in an environment that is both familiar and strange. This type of storytelling has only become more attractive as our technology has advanced and we are constantly inundated with change. But the core values of science fiction have always been relevant, even before our current age of enlightenment. Before the genre became a genre, it could be found in the same cradle as fantasy fairy tales, legends, and folklore. You could argue for the presence of science fiction elements in a lot of early literature, from the epic of Gilgamesh to the Hindu Mahabharata, but I think the most poignant example comes from the second century Greek writer Lucian of Samosata. Lucian was a philosopher, author, and satirist, and his work called True Story or True History is arguably one of the first examples of recognizable science fiction. Lucian's true story was intended to be a parody of earlier works from the likes of Homer, who told of unreal epic quests filled with monsters, all under the guise that these were true stories. By contrast, Lucian's piece begins by establishing on the first page that everything that follows is not true. With that said, the tale launches into an unreal adventure, a ship going from the sea to the moon, getting involved in a war between the inhabitants of the sun and moon, and exploring a sea of milk and an island of cheese. Wallace and Gromit would have a field day with that one. Even from that brief description, you probably recognize a few classic sci-fi tropes. The journey to the moon, for example, is an incredibly recurring theme from Edgar Allan Poe to Jules Verne. However, the presence of science fiction tropes alone does not make Lucian's true story a work of science fiction. Certainly back in his day, they didn't even have the term science fiction to define it by. Much in the way that fantasy could not be thought of as a separate genre until rationalization came along and made clear what was real and unreal, can science fiction really exist if science doesn't exist yet? On a surface level, Lucian's true story is as much fantasy as it is sci-fi. And yet, in the same way that I would argue that the Odyssey counts as fantasy from a modern lens because it is using unbelievable and unreal elements to explore real elements of the human experience, I would say that Lucian's true story uses the same toolbox as modern science fiction, even if there's no actual science involved. If modern sci-fi is, as Asimov puts it, dealing with the reaction of human beings to changes in science and technology, Lucian's story does the same thing, simply utilizing the changes in technology of his day. Lucian's true story is almost 2,000 years old, which, you know, from our perspective seems pretty old, but the works that he was parodying 
are even older than that by hundreds of years. Although science had yet to make leaps and bounds, Lucian society had advanced greatly in matters of philosophy, religion, astronomy, and geology. It is from this advanced perspective that Lucian is able to look back at the old greats and scoff. His true story from a modern lens is science fiction because it is grappling with the ways in which human beings and the way that they categorize the world have changed. No longer is a journey to unknown lands with undiscovered creatures a possibility. The rationalism of his day has revealed these ideas to be foolish, and his sharp sense of self-reflection and self-awareness characterizes much of the best sci-fi of today. Looking back on it, it's not hard to see how stories like this, stories that use newly acquired knowledge and wisdom to critique and reflect on the old, would come to heavily influence the genre today. Lucian's true story with its flashy, untethered journey to the cosmos would go on to inspire a lot of future works, including the landmark 18th century piece, Gulliver's Travels. Written by Jonathan Swift in 1726, Gulliver's Travels is regarded as one of the earliest pseudo-sci-fi English language novels. Under the guise of the classic adventure story, Gulliver's Travels tells us of the sea captain Lemuel Gulliver on his voyage around the sea, recounting his journey and mishaps. Perhaps the most famous of his misadventures is his stop on the island of Lilliput, which is inhabited by tiny people less than six inches tall called Lilliputians. At one point, Gulliver's journey takes him off the face of the earth entirely to the flying city of Lapiada. This is a highly advanced society obsessed with science and progress. Gulliver is taken to a laboratory where he gets to witness firsthand what all of their progress has come to. They've involved themselves in very serious sciencey things, such as trying to mix paint colors based off of smell and, in one case, extracting sunshine from vegetables. He had been eight years upon a project for extracting sunbeams out of cucumbers, which were to be put in files, hermetically sealed, and let out to warm the air in raw inclement summers. He told me that he did not doubt that in eight years more, he should be able to supply the governor's gardens with sunshine. Jonathan Swift used this supposedly advanced society to lambast the contemporary to him, Royal Society of London, a society that was supposed to be dedicated to advancing the natural sciences of the 18th century. It was not an unpopular thought that some of their endeavors were a little bit goofy especially their attempts to convert sunlight to gas or bottle and sell particular regional airs. By mirroring the Royal Society with the Laputian attempts at progress, Jonathan Swift is showing us that even a beautiful flying city can have really, really stupid ideas. This shows off one of sci-fi's most potent abilities, using the unreal or unlikely to make observations about the real world. Swift goes out of his way to make the worlds he builds strange and unfamiliar, which causes us to bypass the fog of experience and see them afresh. And then cognition kicks in. Then once we've judged them properly, we can realize how similar they are to what we know and hopefully come to a much more sober reflection on our society. Once again, Gulliver's Travels is not pure science fiction, nor would it have ever been categorized as science fiction in the time that it was written. But from our modern perspective, we can recognize these as tools of the science fiction genre, tools that have been used since novels first started to be written. The moment that science fiction really started to gain its footing was in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, was first published in 1818 by English author Mary Shelley. Shelley was only a teenager at the time of its writing, but Frankenstein tackles some incredibly nuanced and complex issues, such as the responsibility of a creator, life and death, and most importantly for our current conversation, dangers and risks associated with scientific advancement. The tale follows the young Victor Frankenstein, a boy who grew up with a passion for science. He cut his teeth on older alchemists and philosophers such as Parcellus, Albertus Magnus, and Cornelius Agrippa, and the main appeal of the scientists to Victor Frankenstein was their offers of limitless power. Upon going to university, Victor Frankenstein is initially upset to learn that these scientists, his heroes, have since been quite disproven by modern science, but 
modern science has its own particular appeal. While alchemists made extreme promises and delivered on very little, modern science promises less, but offers almost limitless possibilities. Frankenstein becomes obsessed with the idea of creating life, and this drives him into a mad frenzy, and he cracks through the barriers of morality and decency to craft his own semi-human monster. This monster, this new form of life, immediately horrifies Frankenstein in his wrongness, and it leads him to completely spurn and abandon this newborn creature. Without any guidance or love, the creature is twisted into a monster, too ugly and different to find human company, and unable to produce his own offspring. He's chased out of every town, every village, stoned with rocks thrown at him until he is forced to live alone. And, you know, if there had been personal injury law firms at the time of Frankenstein, I would probably recommend that he check out this video's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm, and they've won so many cases, earning back millions of dollars for their clients. Morgan & Morgan are not afraid to go to court and fight for you to earn you back the largest possible compensation. They are not going to settle for the lowball offers given by insurance companies. Morgan & Morgan has also made the injury law process so modern and so easy. You can submit a claim and chat with your legal team right from your smartphone. Smartphone. It only takes a couple of minutes to see if you have a case, and the best part is that the process is entirely free unless you win. You can start a claim with America's largest injury law firm in just a click. It's so easy. You can start your claim now with Morgan & Morgan at ForThePeople.com slash Jess of the Shire. Thank you so much to Morgan & Morgan for supporting what I do here, and thanks to all of you for checking out my sponsors. The tragic tale of the Doctor and his monster ends with both of them dead and their legacies ruined. It's a resounding warning that progress cannot be made recklessly. This idea that scientific advancement needed to tap the brakes a bit before it spun out of control was particularly pertinent at the time of Shelley's writing of Frankenstein. Science was advancing rapidly, no longer the guesswork of Jonathan Swift's time, but a quickly developing discipline that sought to pick apart the natural world at its seams. Many experiments were being performed examining the idea of electrical resurrection. Scientists had realized that muscles would respond to electrical impulses, and they thought they might be close to discovering the spark of life itself. Frankenstein's journey of grim discovery wasn't mere fantasy. It was something that felt like it could be happening somewhere in a little university town. It was that fear that spurred Shelley into writing this book. She recounts the nightmares that she had the night before she started writing it. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then, on the workings of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frankenstein is an exceedingly complex and in-depth examination of the ramifications of scientific possibility. Without philosophy to temper progress, without ethics and morals behind scientific discovery, mankind could and most likely would create abominations. On the pages of Frankenstein, Shelley plays out the human response to this technological change in all of its gruesome glory. She makes a resounding statement that mankind is not ready for the kind of progress that science promised. Frankenstein is what I would consider to be the first true science fiction, even if that's not all that it is. It was one of the first stories that took real scientific scholarship and discoveries of the time and pushed them forward into a possible future, examining the ethical, moral, and philosophical changes that may be made to human society. Another 19th century author that explored the possibilities of early science fiction was 
Edgar Allan Poe. Just like Shelley, his writing bridged genres because they weren't really a thing yet, encompassing gothic horror, detective novels, and poetry, but some of his works can be considered precursors to science fiction. Just as in his detective novels, Poe rooted his sci-fi-esque stories in a very rich internal logic. He wanted to avoid relying on the supernatural, instead utilizing developments which might conceivably be possible on the basis of present scientific knowledge and the assumption that such developments have in fact been made. His story, The Unparalleled Adventures of Hans Fall, tells the story of a man obviously named Hans Paul, who constructs a spaceship in order to take him to the moon. Fall's device, which is a bit like a souped up hot air balloon, is described in excruciating detail in an attempt to make it as believable as possible. It would contain more than 40,000 cubic feet of gas, would take me up easily, I calculated, with all my implements, and, if I managed rightly, with 175 pounds of ballast into the bargain. It had received three coats of varnish, and I found the cambric muslin to answer all the purposes of silk itself, being quite as strong and a good deal less expensive. The logistics of the balloon and Fall's journey are, of course, unreal and impossible, but the use of such specifications, the incorporation of real-life technology, made it seem very plausible, especially to readers at the time. Poe addresses what would happen to a human being in the vacuum of space. He specifies what type of fuel the balloon is going to need, all in exasperating detail, recounting day by day Fall's marvelous ascent to the heavens. On the moon, he of course discovers a race of strange people, which is quite unreal, but the artificial possibility of the rest of the story makes this feel much more realistic than just standard fantasy. Poe was revolutionary for his emphasis on real or supposedly real science. His strict adherence to the internal logic that he created within these tales propelled them from being basic fantasy to something that seemed like it could one day be possible. One of the writers most directly inspired by Poe was the French author Jules Verne. He's cited as calling Poe the creator of science fiction, and he even copied the tale of Hans Fall in his own From the Earth to the Moon. Verne's works were often more so adventure stories than true sci-fi, but he made masterful use of science as a hook in his narratives. His works like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Around the World in 80 Days, and Journey to the Center of the Earth made use of science as the prompt, the spark that would carry away on the rest of the adventure story. In the mid to late 1800s, when Verne was writing, technology and advancement were in, splashed all across the pages of magazines. He was wise to capitalize on this scientific fervor, and his works captured the optimism of the day, blending together adventure tales, rugged, solitary heroes, and flashy new tech in a way that greatly appealed to the wider public. He certainly wasn't the most scientific sci-fi writer of his time, but his works did a lot to popularize the burgeoning science fiction genre. Towards the end of his career, Verne's readership did begin to steadily decline, but that is not because enthusiasm for the genre was flagging. Rather, so many authors had taken what he created and run with it that he was just becoming too small of a fish in a rapidly growing pond. The true hero of this era of sci-fi was no other than the English author H.G. Wells. Publishing between 1895 and 1941, Wells refined the genre, which at the time was being called scientific romance. In contrast to Verne's tech and gadgets, Wells had a preoccupation with Darwin's idea of evolution, something that made his works much more human-centric. His writing was probably more similar to Shelley than to Verne or Poe, diving deep into philosophical quandaries, examining the human condition and its response to change. In his novella The Time Machine, Wells shows us a far future post-apocalyptic vision of the world in which the social classes of England have evolved to their furthest limit. Human beings have warped, the upper class becoming beautiful but useless, and the lower class toiling away underground, transforming into nonsensical ape-like creatures. He warns of what could be possible if evolution functioned in this way, 
arbitrary societal divisions ruining humanity's future. The Island of Dr. Moreau takes an even more morbid approach, telling of a scientist who slices and dices together human-animal hybrids. It's a grim look at the propensity of mankind to dominate and manipulate, causing agonizing pain in the name of discovery. The protagonist eventually does escape the island of Dr. Moreau, but he's left haunted by what he has seen. Even fully reintegrated into society, he's left wondering what it is that separates man from beast. I look about me at my fellow men, and I go in fear. I see faces keen and bright, others dull and dangerous, others unsteady, insincere, none that have the calm authority of a reasonable soul. I feel as though the animal was surging up through them, that presently the degradation of the islanders will be played over again on a larger scale. This depth, this focus on the human side of science, characterizes Wells' works and would go on to inform much of the genre as it grew from here. Wells perfected Shelley's use of sci-fi, showing that it wasn't just there to uplift and celebrate advancement, but that it could also be used as a dire warning. Wells made startling insinuations about the insignificance of man in the universe. With Wells, science fiction began to take form and direction, becoming more a medium of ideas than a variety of adventure. Still, moving forward into the 20th century, science fiction was permeated with optimism. Rather than looking back, people wanted to look forward into a future that seemed to contain limitless possibilities. The past, by definition, is over and done with. The future, however, like Christmas, is waiting for us to arrive. The young know they're going to go there, and so they furnish it with their wishes. Key to this optimism was the idea of escapism. In the very early 20th century, lost world or lost race fiction was rapidly gaining popularity, combining it with the ever-intriguing adventure story. Named after the 1912 novel of the same title by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, lost world fiction took readers to undiscovered pockets of land, lost cities, and introduced them to yet undiscovered cultures and races. This genre was spurred on by discoveries in geology, archaeology, and paleontology that suggested that there might be a lot hiding right under our noses. Lost world fiction typically had sci-fi elements, but in some cases the sci-fi was made explicit, as lost cities and continents became new planets and alien races. The escapism and optimism of early 20th century sci-fi was shaken by World War I, but it was also made all the more necessary. The glossy new worlds that science fiction promised, the thrilling adventures, the fearless, rugged heroes of the future were a much needed respite from the doom and gloom of politics and war. However, this emphasis on flashy world building and tech left other areas of the genre perhaps a bit underwritten. The stories lacked warmth and author interest was primarily in the gadget, the overwhelming majority of science fiction stories in this period were merely orthodox adventure tales with the trappings of interplanetary travel or prophecy written on an adolescent level. But as the 20th century and its technology advanced, the page was not the only place where science fiction was able to flourish. Even when film was still black and white and silent, filmmakers saw the potential of sci-fi on screen. In the 1902 silent film La Voyage dans la Lune, which translates to a trip to the moon, and I probably just should have said that instead of subjecting you to my attempts to pronounce French, but it tells a classic sci-fi story using, albeit rudimentary, but very cool special effects to tell the tale of a spaceship that is shot at the moon. In 1910, the classic sci-fi story Frankenstein also found its way to the silver screen using fairly advanced special effects to show a monster rising from a cauldron. The new tech of filmmaking seemed to to mesh beautifully with some of the most exciting aspects of science fiction, the ability to see something from the future today. From its very conception, people saw the potential for science fiction and film, and it's not surprising that this is where some of the most exciting science fiction stories have found their home in the 20th and 21st century. However, film was not the only medium for 20th century sci-fi. 
It found its true home in pulp magazines, where short stories or cut-up portions of longer stories were able to fly out to readers at unprecedented rates. The first of these magazines to be dedicated entirely to sci-fi was Hugo Gernsback's Amazing Stories. And Gernsback himself was a bit of a renaissance man, a Jules Verne-style hero, if you will. Having fostered a fascination for all things technical from a very young age, at only 20 years old, he moved alone from Germany to New Jersey, hoping to sell his design for a portable radio telegraph transmitter. Gernsback was able to obtain a copyright for his machine in 1904 and sold the design, kickstarting his career in early 1900s tech. He passed his time inventing and tinkering, often writing for electrical magazines, educating others on how to put together their own electrical contraptions. In 1908, Gernsback started his own magazine for electrical electrical experimenters, which he called Modern Electrics. The magazine was a success, but by 1911, Gernsback found himself needing to fill some page space. His audience had always seemed to appreciate columns in which he hypothesized on the future of tech, so he took this idea and ran with it, spinning a tale of a far-off future in their magnificent machines. This was an instant hit, and soon these fictional scientific explorations found their way onto the pages of many electrical magazines, including his own. By 1926, Gernsback decided to start a magazine dedicated entirely to these stories, which he called Amazing Stories. Their motto was extravagant fiction today, cold fact, tomorrow. And they published stories which Gernsback coined as scientifiction tales, which would later be changed to the more easy to pronounce science fiction. This is the first time that the genre would be called that, as opposed to Vern and Wells scientific romance, and this represents a very important distinction. Gernsback's storytelling idea was that of idea first and character second. He put a heavy emphasis on the science rather than the scientific romance, spinning tales that contained strange tech, superheroes, and even some early space operas. It was all about the gadget, the brave heroes, rather than the wider implications upon the human race. He captured the lightning-in-a-bottle, optimistic sci-fi of the early 20th century, birthing the modern genre's name and some of its most familiar tropes. However revolutionary he was, though, Gernsback was far from perfect. Despite being a writer himself, he paid his writers just abysmally and would often wait as long as possible to pay them back, if he paid them back at all. He was a businessman, and it seems that he was ready to treat this emerging genre as, first and foremost, a business venture. This is unfortunately a bit of a running theme. Some people do propose that this early difficulty for sci-fi authors to make a living may have helped them acting as a kind of crucible, making sure that only the people who really loved writing science fiction for the sake of itself were able to make the cut. Just as laboratory rats, who are never fed to satiety, tend to live longer, albeit hungrier lives, so science fiction writers, unheeded beyond the ghetto walls, are often uncommonly productive. Gernsback was so highly revered for his influence on the genre that his name was put on the Hugo Awards, which recognize new and exciting science fiction and fantasy and are still being awarded today, albeit somewhat controversially. However, Amazing Stories was far from the only pulp sci-fi on the market, and one of its main competitors was the very similarly named astounding stories. And just as Gernsback and his taste shaped amazing stories, one man looms large at the heart of astounding stories, John W. Campbell. Campbell had grown up on a steady diet of early 20th century sci-fi, and he even wrote some of his own space operas, including the novella that would become the 1982 film The Thing. His writing was not destined to be his primary legacy, though, as he landed an editing job at Astounding Stories. Campbell quickly rose to prominence, known not only for scouting some of the most prominent authors of mid-century science fiction, but for shaping their works as well. He was the top dog, the gatekeeper, the decider of what worked in science fiction in this very influential era, and some of his whims and tastes can still be seen 
in modern science fiction. He guided the genre away from tech-obsessed, rather shallow stories, and into something a little bit closer to Wells' acute social commentary. Campbell had wanted to be an inventor or a scientist, and when he found himself working as an editor instead, he redefined pulps as a laboratory for ideas. Improving the writing, developing talent, and handing out entire plots for stories. He turned science fiction from a literature of escapism into a machine for generating analogies. Campbell is credited with discovering a lot of 20th century sci-fi names, including Isaac Asimov, publishing his incredibly influential Foundation series first on the pages of Astounding. He also became quite close to Robert A. Heinlein, launching his incredibly prolific science fiction career. His most dubious claim to fame is likely his relationship with L. Ron Hubbard, the science fiction author turned founder of the Scientology religion cult. Hubbard was already a successful pulp writer before he and Campbell met, but once they started working together, they formed a very deep friendship. Campbell was an avid supporter of Hubbard's Dianetics, the modern science of mental health. Dianetics is now considered a religious text of Scientology, and it preaches a new, more scientific tactic towards mental health, which fails to be backed up by any actual medical research. Still, this pseudoscience deeply appealed to Campbell and many other sci-fi fans who hoped that mental health science could be boiled down to a precise method as it could in so many of their sci-fi fables. As Hubbard broke off to form his Scientology religion, their friendship did come to an end, but Campbell was always envious of what Hubbard had been capable of. He saw what Hubbard had done, creating a religion, gathering a group of people who worshipped the ground he walked on, as something ripped right out of the pages of Astounding Stories. One of Campbell's most prized storytelling tropes was that of the Superman, or the superhuman, a singular hero who could step in and save the day entirely by virtue of being super. This idea infuses many of the works that he had influence over, meaning it is an inevitable part of the backbone of the golden age of science fiction. However, as perhaps could be gathered from the fact that he envied the founder of Scientology, Campbell was far from a perfect person. It is worth noting at this point in the video that that could be said of a fair few of the authors that I have mentioned thus far. H.G. Wells, for example, was like super into eugenics, but unfortunately I don't have the time to address all of that in this video. So, you know, do your research before you like set up a shrine to any of these authors or anybody in general. Uh, don't worship writers or celebrities past, present, or future. That's, um, that's weird. For Campbell, though, his proclivities, both good and bad, are exceedingly relevant because his taste shaped the golden era of science fiction. His anti-Semitic views, his sexist and racist tendencies are ingrained into many of Astounding's most popular and influential stories, and that is something that modern sci-fi authors are still trying to rectify today. His views were so polarizing that authors like Heinlein, who found their career in Campbell, would go on to disavow him entirely, and the wave of fiction that followed this, new wave sci-fi, is in essence, an attempt to get away from this Campbellian fiction. Still, during this period from about the 30s to the 50s, science fiction blossomed. The 30s to the 50s is obviously a very wide range, but there is some debate on what exactly was the golden age of science fiction, and it kind of flourished through this whole period in very different ways. And the genre had changed majorly in this time. The sci-fi shaped by Astounding and other pulps of the 50s had moved away from the high hyper-optimistic tech-obsessed of the early 20th century and into a more introspective, reflective, and psychological approach. Writers refined their plots and characters while emphasizing human relationships, and were encouraged by Campbell to tap psychology, philosophy, politics, and other soft sciences and areas of specialization. While pre-war science fiction had concentrated on the technical wonders suggested by scientific advances, 
Writers in the post-World War II period began to examine the human consequences of these advances, and the fear that we might become the victims of our own creations. Even in adventure stories, wandering off to distant lands and alien creatures, authors made efforts to ground their stories and to humanize both human and non-human characters. They no longer wanted to look at the future and technology as something strange and alien. They wanted to grapple with the ethical and moral implications of a future that seemed to be getting closer day by day. The 1950s saw the first satellites making it into space, the beginning of the end of segregation, the rise of the atomic age. The future was more near than ever, more possible than ever. Dystopias found their foothold in this golden era of science fiction, works like Fahrenheit 451 and A Clockwork Orange exploring the possibilities of grim futures. Works like Frank Herbert's Dune and other revolutionary new wave science fiction was on the horizon, ready to turn the whole genre on its head. The balance that Campbell had struck between hard and soft sci-fi seemed to set the genre alight, ripe for critique from both fans and scholars, and it was becoming increasingly clear that sci-fi was not a passing fad. Pulps had turned to hardcover books, rabid fans had turned into esteemed scholars, and a genre that was once fringe and strange, barely touched upon by established authors, was becoming the new mythos of the atomic age. And I think the reason for this is evident. We need sci-fi, especially the kind of sci-fi that was coming out in the later part of the Golden Age, because it forces us to look inwards. Just like Lucian's true story, we need to look back at what we have come from, to examine our changing modes of thought, to look at old information in a new light. Just as in Gulliver's Travels, sci-fi allows us to see our world with new eyes, to find out what's valuable and what's not, to recenter humanity on what matters. Sci-fi like Frankenstein calls us to look forward, to examine the ramifications of all of our actions, especially those made in the name of progress. Science fiction gives us the tools to examine the past, the present, and the future. It gives us the space to think about who we are and why we do what we do. It encourages us to both think and act to anticipate our future, but not to rush into it recklessly. Science fiction is a tool that we have been using since the beginning of time, and it has never been more relevant than now. We need some way to look at ourselves objectively, to see who we have been, who we will be, and the science fiction genre holds up a mirror to us and shows us who we are. This video is... I will admit, far from comprehensive, but frankly, if I try and cram anything more into this, I won't get it out on time, so uh, please let me know in the comments who I missed. It's funny, because with fantasy, we can look back from our perspective and say that someone like Tolkien is the father of the modern fantasy genre. People will debate that point, of course, but that's a conversation for another video. But I'm not sure that figure exists for sci-fi. We were discussing this on my Discord, which is available through my Patreon, and the link is in the description, but we weren't able to come to any solid conclusions. So let me know in the comments who you would call the parent of the sci-fi genre, if there is any, and if you can't think of one or you don't think there is one, I would love to hear why. For those of you that have been asking, the Dune video is on its way, of course, I promise, that is why I made this video as a primer for that, but if you don't want to miss my Dune video, please do subscribe. Like this video if you enjoyed it, and thank you so much for tuning in this week. This video was a beast to create and quite frankly a bit out of my comfort zone but I had a lot of fun putting it together. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day. Mm -hmm.